Hey, we've got a special treat for you today, um, <clears throat> and uh, this is uh, Taylor Hodge, who is our worship pastor, and you can typically get to watch him. Hey, and by the way, can we say thank you to Ryan and the worship team this morning for uh, their, their work? Um, and part of the reason Ryan's leading today is because Taylor Hodge, who you typically get to see uh, leading worship on Sunday mornings, is actually going to be sharing the message today, and he's going to sing the whole thing. It's going to be incredible. So, uh, no, he's not going to do that. But would you do me a huge favor and give Taylor Hodge a big call welcome? Thank you very much, Brian. It's good to be here this morning. Yeah, there we go. Hey, good morning, guys. How are we doing this morning? Good. It's good to see the 12 of you here with us today. Um, yeah, just as Brian said, my name is Taylor Hodge. I'm the worship pastor here, and I get the privilege of bringing the word to you guys today. Um, for those of you who know nothing about me, this is what I look like. Um, this is my wife, Natalia, here in the second row, who I love and who I'm so grateful for. Um, we have... Two kids together, uh, almost three, our daughter Shiloh, who is four years old, and our son Noah, who is uh, two at the end of this month, and then our unborn son Jonah, who will be here in March, so we're looking forward to that too. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm really excited to be up here, and I know Brian already mentioned this, but seriously, thank you to Ryan and the worship team for covering for me. Brian's asked me a couple times in the years that I've been here if I'd be interested in speaking. I'm like, yeah, I'd be interested in that. I just need, need someone to cover for me. So it's really nice to be able to still have a, a solid, solid team um, to cover. So praise God for them. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so I've, I've spoken at a few other church environments um, in my time in ministry, and all of them uh, have not been here. Um, but I am really, seriously, I'm really excited to be able to be up here before, and it seems like every time that I do get the opportunity to speak, um, God really pretty, I mean, pretty quickly places something on my heart to talk about, and um, nine times out of ten, it is what I am currently going through in life, so this morning as I'm sharing, you get to hear about what uh, I'm going through in my life. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so... My speaking style is, uh, it's a little bit different than, than Brian's. Brian is, and I appreciate him so much, and I know you guys do as well. He, yeah, we can totally give him a, yeah. Brian is very gifted from the Lord and is really, really good at communicating. And um, how much were you going to give me for this? Again? Is it 10 bucks? You can give it to me after service. I don't want to be weird right now. Um, <clears throat> Brian is a very gifted communicator, and we are so blessed to have him here at our church, and um, I'm blessed as a staff member to be, to be working under somebody like him and his leadership, and so I just appreciate him, and um, he just makes it look so easy up here, you know, and it's not easy, but he makes it look that way, and it's just so easy to understand. He makes the scriptures really applicable to your lives, and that's what I personally love about it. I know you guys do too. Um, so my style is not like that. I just, um, I just tend to make a lot less sense. And I stutter a little bit. So um, if I don't do a good job, just remind yourselves that I'm a worship pastor and not a speaking pastor. Okay? <laughs> All right. Good. Um, so as I, as I, before, I mean, before I really get started here, um, ushers, if you guys would go ahead and do we have any ushers? Yep. We're going to get some in just a minute here. If you guys would just make your way up the aisle. If you guys need a Bible, a pen, program notes, any of that. By the way, these program notes are pretty elaborate, so uh, don't miss out on that. You're going to want to get, what's so funny? Um, <clears throat> just slip your hand up, and they will be happy to. He will, there's one, so give him some time. He'll be happy to, to get that to you. And if you're watching online, go ahead and go to our website and go to the watch, pa the watch page, um, and then click message notes. You can download those right onto your phone. Or we have a church app now. Yeah, anybody using the app this morning? Great, none of you. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Um, so as you guys are uh, getting those, Anybody else need those? Yeah, we've got a couple more. As you guys are grabbing those, I'm going to pray for us, so if you would bow your heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning, Lord. I thank you for the privilege of being able to be in relationship with you. I thank you that in the hard times, Lord, when we are going through loss and sickness and the parts that we don't really like, 
that you're still with us, Lord. I thank you for being so present with us, Holy Spirit. I pray this morning that not only would you speak through me, um, but that you would continue to speak to me as I share what I believe you've placed on my heart, Lord. But I, most importantly, I pray that people would hear from you this morning, that your church would be able to really tap into your love for them this morning. We love you. We thank you. We praise you, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me ask you guys a question. Do you like the valley? And you're like, um, what does he mean? And you're like, nah, I moved up here to the hills of Amador County. I hate the valley. It's not that kind of valley I'm talking about. I'm talking about the valley. The valley in your life. You know, like when you have everything you could ever dream of, your life is great. Everything that you could ever ask for, you have. But then it just gets taken from you. Or maybe you lose your job. Maybe you lose a relationship. Maybe, maybe your marriage is falling apart. Maybe you've been sober for a long time. And you've kind of slipped back into that. Maybe you struggle with other sorts of addictions. And all of that stuff just kind of stacks and stacks and stacks and it just feels like it's going to fall on you. You know that feeling? No one wants to admit it because it sucks. That's just the truth. It does, right? Can we admit that? Is there anybody brave enough to admit that they were in that season this morning? Yeah, it's hard. It's really, really hard. We don't like that feeling. We don't like it because... It, well, it doesn't feel good, first of all. We don't feel loved. We don't feel cared for. We don't feel, I mean, fill in the blank. I mean, it's just a bad season to be in, right? We like it when it feels good. We like it when our life is good and our life is on track. We like it when we have everything we could ever need. We like it when our relationships are good, when our marriages are good and healthy and strong, when our friendships are good, when our, our relationship with our family is good, like our parents, like... In-laws, okay, in-laws can be hard, but like when all that stuff is good and you don't have anything to complain about, it's, it feels good, right? Somebody say, it feels good. Okay, thank you, three of you. Maybe you're thinking of a time right now where you've had that before. Not that you're necessarily in a valley, but maybe you can think of a specific moment in your life where you're like, dang, I feel good. My life is great. You know, the problem, at least for me, and I'm just going to be totally transparent, like I told you, this is something that God has been stirring in me. And in, pre in preparing for this message, I was really convicted at all of the areas that I have fallen short and continue to fall short. But for me, the problem is, is when I'm in the season in life where I have everything that I need, I can't think of anything else to ask for. I can't think of anything else that I need. There aren't any underlying issues with anything. I forget to praise the one who's given me all of those things to begin with. Anybody in that boat? The part that scares me with that is, is for me, it's actually easy. And I don't even like admitting that. But it's easy for me to just kind of fall out of the, the constant praise of like, Lord, you've, you've blessed me with all of this. This isn't anything I did. It's easy, and that's what's scary about it. Let me ask you another question. Do you guys have, um, do you have one of those, those cute little baby, like, pocket Jesuses that you can pull out of your pocket? Like, here he is. I need something, so here he is. Let me pull him out real quick. Oh, hey, listen. Um, I could use some help with this. And then it goes right back in, and that's it, right? You ever have one of those? Like when stuff hits the fan? Ooh, can I say that? When all of a sudden, like, all the stuff in your life that was going great, it collapses, and then you're like, Lord, okay, I need you now. You see, but the problem with that is when you had everything you already needed, you didn't, you weren't with them. You, you weren't praising them. 
So now in the season, now you lose everything, right? And not, you don't even know how to act. You don't even know what to say because you haven't been practicing. You haven't been practicing. It's almost like we unintentionally pull them out of our pockets and we're like, hey, Lord, thanks. See you later. I'll let you know if I need anything. See you later. That's not the kind of relationship that that God wants to have with us. If you're familiar with the story of Job, um, Job is what we're going to be spending some time in Scripture in this morning. So if you want to open your Bibles and turn to Job, if you remember um, just not too long ago we were going through uh, the book of Esther. And Esther is right before Job. Job is right before the book of Psalms. So if you open up right to the middle of your Bible, um, it should be Psalms, Proverbs, somewhere in there. Just hang a left and you'll get to Job. It's right before the book of Psalms, okay? So we're going to go right in there in chapter 1. Um, and I'm just going to read this for us. So if you guys want to, if you guys want to follow along, I really want to encourage you, if you don't have a Bible, get one out because we're going to spend a lot of time in Scripture this morning. Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in their house, and each one on his day, and they, they would send an invite to their three sisters and eat and drink with them. In verse five, and when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning, offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Continually, that's a key word there, we'll touch on that. Verse six says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and going fro on the earth and from the walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered, have you seen my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and who turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, sassy Satan. Somebody say sassy Satan. There you go. He says this, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the works of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But watch this, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. He'll curse you to your face. And then the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So don't hurt him. Don't take his life. So Satan left the presence of the Lord. Okay, so here's what's going on. Basically, Job has everything that he could ever need. He has the sheep. He has the camels. He has the oxen. He has the donkeys. He has the servants. He has the kids. He has the house. He has the land. Everything. Everything he could ever want, he has. Okay? But here's what's really cool. The part where Job would send and consecrate them and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. What does that mean, church? That means Job remained in prayer. He didn't wait. He didn't wait until his kids did something that was really, really bad. He said, just in case they did something bad. Just in case. I'm just going to remain in prayer. I'm going to pray for my family. I'm going to pray for my kids. See, a lot of the times we just wait until something goes wrong, right? It's okay to admit that in church. It's okay. Sometimes we wait till everything goes wrong. And then we pray. And then we read in that second section where Satan's like, Lord, listen. Yeah, he's great. But he's only great because you've given him everything he needs. 
Take it away. Watch what happens. Like, mm, Satan's testing God. You don't test God, people. But, but God in his wisdom and, and in his understanding, he says, all right, all right, Satan. Okay. Go ahead. Everything that Job has is now in your hands. Just don't take his life. Do what you want. He won't curse me. He won't curse me. So listen to what happens. Verse 13. Now there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of a sword, so killed them all. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Whoa. Before Job could even say anything, there came another messenger and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants consumed them and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while Job still couldn't say anything, there came another one and said, the Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of a sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still yet able to speak, there came another and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell upon them and they are dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. Get this in verse 20. Then Job arose, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, and he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, God didn't sin or charge God with wrong. Job didn't sin, excuse me, or charge God with wrong. Did you catch that in verse 20? Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and what? Come on, and what? Worshipped. What? Who does that? He just lost everything. He lost everything. All of his animals are gone. His house is gone. His kids are gone. They're dead. What does he do? He falls on his knees and he worships. And he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and he takes away. In other words, God, I see that you probably have a plan here. You probably have something going on. I don't know what it is, but I worship you because I trust you. You see, because he's, he's remaining, before that happened, he was remaining in Jesus, remaining in a relationship with God. He was praying continually. He was training. Because listen, church, if you're not in a valley right now, odds are you're gonna get in one soon. That's just the honest truth. That's how life works. You don't have to like it. Job didn't like it. We'll read that in a minute. But it's the truth. So if we're training when we're in the blessing, then we'll know what to do when we're not. Amen? It gets worse, though. Chapter 2, verse 7 says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord again, struck Job with loathsome sores, so that's likely leprosy, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in his ashes. Whoa. So not only did Job now lose everything that he had, kids, house, land, animals, servants, now he lost his health. Now he doesn't even have that. And he's sitting there scraping himself with the agony that he is in. It gets worse. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold your integrity? Or in other words, do you still worship God, Job? And then she says, curse him and die. His wife said that. Okay, ladies, listen. Let me tell you something. Probably shouldn't say that to your husbands. It's not super encouraging. <laughs> it gets even worse. It gets even worse. So Job has friends. Friends. He has three of them. And they're texting each other because they heard about all this stuff that's going on with Job. So they're like, 
They're like, hey, guys, listen. Our buddy Job, he's, he's going through something. Are you guys free? Could we, like, maybe get together and go be with him for a minute? See how he's doing. And they, they text back. They're like, yeah, 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 we're free, we're free, we're free. Where do you want to meet? So they go and meet Job. They sit with him for seven days and seven nights, but they don't say anything. They're just sitting with him in his presence. You know, that reminds me of a story, um, not a story, it's a true story of uh, something that happened to me in high school. It's a long story, so I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Um, I was really, really into working out and fitness, and um, in fact, part of my story is this story, and I'll save the whole story for another time, but... Um, I actually, it was really unhealthy. I began to idolize the way that my body looked and how much muscle I had. I know you're like, wow, his arms are still really huge. Um, um, and so I was, I was really sick, actually. I got really sick. I think it was the flu, if I remember correctly. And I went to the gym, stupid, while I had the flu, this was before COVID, obviously. This was high school time. And, uh, and I worked out really hard with the flu. I'm like, what the heck? I look back, what the heck were you thinking, Taylor? With the flu, you were already dehydrated. Anyway, so what happened was um, I went home after that gym. I, I was probably there for an hour and a half or so. And I longboarded home, which is basically just a big skateboard. And it was like eight miles home. So I got my cardio in before and after. Um, and then I get home and I just... I just crashed. I physically couldn't move. My arms locked up like this. My legs were straight as an arrow. Um, and I'm skipping a lot of detail, of course, for the sake of time. But um, I remember my mom was home. She came up uh, to make sure I was okay. I'm like, yeah, I'm good, mom. I'm just sick. I'm going to take a nap, whatever. She comes up like four hours later. I'm in the same spot, just like. And she goes, uh, what, are you, what are you doing, bud? And I couldn't talk. I couldn't do anything. I mean, I was in so much pain. I physically could not get my arms to move. She tried. My mom tried to pull them, and I'm just screaming in pain. And then when she would let go, because I'm screaming, it would just kind of shoot back up. So my muscles were just like, were just tightening so much. And so she calls the ambulance. They come. They pick me up, take me to the ICU. I ended up in the ICU for roughly seven days. A little ironic. And, uh, and I remember there was a moment. There was a moment I was in the ICU. And I was really, really depressed, really discouraged. Not only was I in physical pain, I was in emotional pain too because my pride was being destroyed because I idolized the way that my body looked. And I'm laying there in my hospital bed, literally seeing my body change in size because what I was diagnosed with it's called rhabdomyolysis. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. In short, it's a condition that never goes away. You always have it. And um, if you overexert yourself, basically what happened, I overexerted myself way too bad and I was super dehydrated. So what happens is my muscles were trying to find nutrients. So they were actually physically, and I mean this literally, they were eating themselves because they were trying to find some sort of nutrients. And so I'm laying there in my bed after all of this, my hospital bed, after all this work of going to the gym and like seeing real progress physically, and I'm like, man, I'm, I love the way that I look. And then seeing all of that literally go away in a day. I don't remember the exact amount, but I lost somewhere between 10 and 15 pounds in like four days. And I couldn't figure out why God was letting this happen to me. And my friend, Chris is his name. I'll never forget him. Chris came early one morning, that day that I was super depressed and discouraged. Chris came to visit. And Chris stayed with me for 24 hours. He canceled all his plans. He came and stayed with me and sat next to me on my bed for 24 hours. Didn't complain. We didn't talk a whole lot. But I knew that he was there for me. He just wanted to be with me. You guys have any friends like that? Yeah? It's a good gift. Job's friends? You might think at first, yeah, yeah, that's kind of like Job's friends. I sat there for seven days. Oh, yeah. No. Job's friends are jerks. Okay? 
That's just the truth. Job's friends are jerks. This is what happened. He has three of them. They're all three with him. The first one, after seven days, they're like, okay, it's been seven days. We're hungry. We're thirsty. Okay, time to break the silence. Job, listen, buddy. Um, I, think, I think I know why this is happening to you. You have some crazy bad sin in your life. You can read this. This is actually what his friends are saying. You have some crazy bad sin in your life, Job, and God's punishing you. And then Job retaliates and says, no, I have no sin, but you know what? If I do, Lord, I'm sorry. I worship you. And he continues to worship him. And then his second friend says, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think he's right. I think he's right. Mm-hmm. You know what else? I think you're being kind of a sissy. Job, I think you're being kind of a sissy. It's not that big of a deal. And he says, if you just, basically, in essence, what he's saying, if you just pretend like what you're going through is like not that big of a deal, it's going to be fine. So he minimizes everything that's going on. And then his third friend, oh, his third friend is a gem, let me tell you. You know what he says? He says, yeah, yeah, Job, mm-hmm, they're right. You know what else? You deserve worse. He says that. Great friends. Wow. I'd be, if I was Job, I'd be like, hey, wow, guys, thanks for, uh, thanks for staying with me for seven days. Can you just get out now? Because you're kind of rude. He doesn't do that. He, def- he actually defends God. Like, what the heck? If we go back to chapter, or that, the first section in chapter one, when God says he's an upright and blameless man, wow, he really is an upright and blameless man. So check this out. Let's go down the list. His kids are gone. His house is gone. His land is gone. Animals are gone. Now his three relationships with his friends are gone because they're jerks and his relationship with his wife is now gone because she thinks that he should curse God and die. You think, what the heck else is, what's gonna happen next? But even after all of that, he still worships. It's amazing. If we turn to chapter 13, If I turn to chapter 13. Um, chapter 13, verse 13 says, this is Job speaking, okay? And this is, um, this is a, section, a section, chapter 13, you can read the whole thing for yourself, but this is where Job is, is basically saying, even though all of this is happening, I'm still gonna put my hope in, hope in the Lord, hope in God. And he says, let me have silence and I will speak. And let come on, let come on me what may. Let whatever happen, happen. Why should I take my flesh and my teeth and put my life in my hand? Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Though all this stuff is happening, this is Job saying, I believe, Lord, that you love me and that you care about me. And I know that you have a plan. So I'm going I'm to put my hope in you. I know you're doing something. And you're thinking like, oh, yeah, great. Good for Job. He's got it all under control. He's worshiping God when his life sucks. And good for him. I can't do that. And that's fine. God, Job isn't happy about it, friends. He's not happy about it. In fact, he wishes he was dead. So if we read in verse 3, I know we're going back and forth. I'm sorry. I told you this is going to be interesting this morning. Verse 3 says, let the day perish on which I, this is Job talking. Let, let the day perish on which I was born. And that night said, a man is conceived, let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let the clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, that night let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry enter it. Let those who curse it, who curse the day, who are ready to to rouse up Leviathan. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none. Nor see the eyelids of the morning, because it didn't shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth, come out of the womb and expire? Woo! Ever been there? Dang. So Job's not happy, guys. I'm not up here saying like, hey, be more like Job. It's fine. Like Job's second friend. Like, hey, you're just being a sissy. It's fine. No, no, no. Job is not happy about it. He's real. That's the kind of God that we serve. He wants us to be real with him. But if you catch it, he's not cursing God. 
He's cursing the day that he was born. It's different. And you can read the rest of chapter three. That entire chapter is like some weird, dark poem about how much Job wishes he was dead. It's a very, very real and raw spot to be in. It's hard. Someone say it's hard. Come on. Somebody say it's hard. But it's not for nothing. Somebody say it's not for nothing. You guys, you got to wake up. This is second service. Somebody say it's hard. But say it's not for nothing. God knows what he's doing. You think, I, I think what we need to do, I wonder, you know what? I wonder what it would be like and I wonder what we would see God do if we shifted the posture of our hearts a little bit. I'm not saying minimize everything you're going through because here, let's just full stop for a minute. I'm not minimizing your valley. End of sentence, no buts at all. I'm not minimizing your valley. I see you, God sees you, he loves you, he knows you. He knows what's best for you. He has a plan for you. Do you believe that? Amen. Okay, that's my full stop moment. Moving on. I think, um, I think we would see God do some pretty amazing things if we shifted the way that we thought from God, I worship you if you get me out of this valley. God, I worship you if you heal my marriage. God, I worship you if you teach me how to be a better parent. Oh, but by the way, I don't want to learn how to be a better parent. I just want you to make me a better parent. God, I will worship you if you help me to be more patient. I'm giving the camera guys a run for their money right now. <laughs> Come on, no. God, I worship you if. Or God, I worship you, but I'm not going to worship you to the fullest extent because I'm not super happy where I'm at right now. I've been there. I have been there, church. I'd be willing to bet that maybe some of us here this morning are as well. What about this one? God, I, I worship you if you get this man out of office. God, I worship you if you put this man in office. Oh, I went there and I said it. Hey. Hey. Right? Thank you. Somebody's being honest this morning. What if we shifted that from that to, God, I worship you because, God, I worship you because I know what you're doing, because I don't need to know what you're doing, but I know you know what you're doing, because I know that I'm in this valley right now, because you're trying to shape my character, because I'm going to be somebody who you want me to be someday, but in order to be that person, I have to go through this valley. what would we see God do if that's how our hearts were? Amen? Come on. What if it's something simple, like, I don't know, like if there's finances involved? I'll talk about finances because everybody hates talking about their finances. What if you're like, Lord, I, I need some more money I'm really struggling. You know those moments like where everything is really bad and you're like, oh shoot, how do I, how do I pay for this bill? Or I'm gonna lose my house. That's a real spot to be in. When you're in those moments, I think if we could back up for just a quick second, if we were to be training ourselves to praise God and to remain in him when we're in the good season, when we're in those seasons of, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to live this week or buy food, it's going to be easier, not easy, but it's going to be easier to remain in him when it's hard. That's just how it works. Lord, if we're like, God, God, please, please, please give me this raise. Please. Maybe there's a raise at work. Please give me this, or promotion. Please give me this promotion or job change that's going to pay better. Lord, please give this to me. Please. I really need it. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I really need it. If God gave that to us, just like that, here's the problem. You see, we don't know how to deal with our finances with what we do have. We don't, we don't know how to be wise with the money that God has blessed us with yet. Right? So if God gives us that raise when we don't know how to deal with our money, 
all of a sudden what happens is a week, a month, a year, whatever, down the road, we're like, oh, shoot. Well, that sucks. I need more money again. Right? That's a real spot, guys. I mean, I've been there too. It's like, well, shoot. What happened to all the money that God gave me? Well, you spent it because you don't know how to be a good steward. In my experience, that's maybe happened to me a couple times, but most of the time it's God, God will say yes to a lot of things. I think we don't realize that. But it's, yeah, I'll give you that, but not yet. Not yet. You're not ready. Mm-mm. You're not ready yet. You're not ready. You see, here's, here's the problem. We forget. We forget that there is a backside to every blessing. You're like, what does that mean? Somebody say there's a backside to the blessing. Okay, that, we'll work on that. You guys are, are, you, are you guys with me this morning? Okay, there's a backside to the blessing. We don't tend to look at the backside to every blessing. We tend to look at the benefit of every blessing. Lord, that was from the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. I'm gonna say it again. We don't look at the backside to the blessing as much as we look for the benefit in the blessing. What I mean by that is we just look at what we want to get out of the blessing. We don't want to look at what God wants to teach us through the blessing. Right? That's what happens. So it's like God says, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. I'll give you that raise. Sure, you can have more money. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. You're not ready. I'm going to allow you. If you want that raise, I'll give it to you. But you know what? There's going to be a season in your life for however, however long, years, days, weeks, whatever. Likely it's pretty long and we give up. There's going to be a season in your life where you're going to really, really experience what it's like to have nothing. I'll still provide for you. You'll have everything you need. Not what you picture it, though. I'm going to allow you to walk through some really hard financial times. If you want that raise, this is what you need to do. This is the backside to the blessing, church. He said yes, remember? Because here's the problem. If we don't learn, we're not going to be faithful with it. And by God's grace, when he brings us out of those seasons, you see, now the cool part is that we're not only learning how to be wiser with our money and appreciate the value of money, but most importantly, we're learning the value of the provider. We're learning the value of his provision. We're learning the value of his promise that he's gonna provide for us. Somebody say amen. Amen. That's how God works because he wants what's best for you. He wants to shape your character. He wants to see you become who he's called you to be. Job made it a habit to remain in relationship and conversation with the Lord. He made it a habit. And again, because he made it a habit, when God allowed Satan to test Job's loyalty to him, and when Satan took everything from him, he even still remained in prayer, remained in relationship, and even took it a step further and defended God. Flip over to chapter 42. That's the very last chapter in Job. I'll give you just a quick second to get there. Chapter 42, verse 10. It says this in verse 10. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. You see that? You guys, let me remind you. That's the end of Job, okay? There's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle that we didn't get to read, that I want to encourage you to read. Job gets rebuked by people, and then he gets rebuked by God himself. I want to encourage you to read that. So this is the end of the chapter of, or of the book of Job, and he's still praying. Come on. He's still praying. And you know what? Did you catch who he's praying for? His jerk friends. You know what, Lord? I don't like these guys anymore because they were rude and harsh and insensitive, but you know what? I know you love them, so I'm gonna pray for them. 
And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job, get this, twice as much as he had before. Verse 11, then came to him all of his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with them in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Each day, and each day they gave him a piece of money And a ring of gold. So he's starting to get his his stuff back, right? Verse 12, and the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of his first daughter, Jemima, and the name of his second, Keziah, and the name of the third, Karenhapuch. And in all the land, there were no women as beautiful as Job's daughters. No women. They were the most beautiful. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years. Holy shnikes, that's old. And saw his sons and his son's sons four generations. And Job died an old man and full of days. Which means, and full of joy. Full of joy. That's cool, right? You know what that tells me? That tells me that the prize is worth the pain. The prize is worth the pain. God knows what he is doing, church. He knows what he's doing. And maybe this morning you're asking, like, or maybe you're saying to yourself, like, okay, yeah, that's really, really great for Job. Like, what does that mean for me? Well, take away what you want from it but here's what I would hope that you get from it. First, I hope you know that when it feels like God has left you, I want you to remember his promise to you. His promise, his words. He says in Hebrews that I will never leave you or forsake you. Never. There's no conditions with that, friends. It's not... I will stay with you. I won't ever leave you as long as you do this, 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 and this. No, God in his grace, if you are a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, he will always be with you, no matter the season. That's the kind of God that we serve. God doesn't say, you need to clean up your act a little bit first before you come to me. Mm -mm. that's not the kind of God that we serve. The kind of God that we serve says, no, 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 bring your garbage to me and I'll put it on. I'll wear that burden. I will clean up your act. Amen? That's the kind of God that we serve, church. And again, in in Deuteronomy, it says, um, it is the Lord, Deuteronomy uh, Deuteronomy 31, 8 says, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Don't fear or be dismayed. So, like, current state of the world, church, don't fear. Don't be dismayed. He goes before you. He's already before, he's before you. He's in front of you. He's beside you. He knows what's happening, guys. Come on. Don't worry about what's happening. Don't fear. He's with you. He'll never leave you. Second, if you're in the season right now in your life where everything is great and as it should be, You have the cars, you have the house, or houses if you're so lucky. You have the land, you have the great relationships with your family, you have a phenomenal marriage, all of it, fill in the blank. You have everything. I want you to celebrate that. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. God's blessed you. God's blessed you, amen? Enjoy that. He wants you to enjoy that. He really does. But there's a but to that one. You have to remain in him. You have to remember the provider of all those blessings. Right? And then lastly, if you are the person that is in a very deep, deep valley this morning, whether watching online or here in the building I said this earlier, I'm going to say it again. I see you, and God sees you. He's with you. And he loves you. 
So I wanna encourage you guys with one thing before I, I pray, and the team's gonna come back up and we're gonna sing and reflect on how much we need him. I forgot where I was going with that thought, but it felt really good leading up to it. <laughs> um, obviously, it doesn't matter. So Jesus loves you. Hey, have a great week. Um, darn it. Well, that stinks. And now I know how Brian feels when that happens to him. Uh, Oh, I remember. Okay, when when you're when you're in the season of that, you know, and you're in the valley, and you're and you're just asking like, why, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Just change. I want to encourage you. I know it's not, it's easier said than done. I get that. I'm not being insensitive, but just try a little bit and watch what God does. Just try to change your attitude a little bit. Instead of asking, why are you letting this happen to me? Try asking this, God. What are you trying to teach me? what part of my life is maybe out of whack or what part of my path to you is broken? What, what is it about my character that needs to be built? Try asking that. I promise you that you will hear from the Lord. Maybe not right away. You might have to wait a little bit, but remain in that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for what you have done for us, Lord, as we just celebrated this Christmas season of you sending your son. Father, we worship you with everything that we have this morning. Not if or but, but because. We worship you because you are good. Even when life is bad, even when things are bad, we worship you because you are good. Just because our life is bad does not mean that you are bad. You are good. We love you. We praise you. Lord, I pray a special prayer of encouragement for those who are in the valley this morning. Be with them, Lord. Show them your grace. Show them your love. Show them your comfort. Lord, I pray that you would give us a newfound joy in your name and in our relationship with you this morning. Thank you, God. We love you and we praise you and all God's people said, amen.